did you have him when he was alive? No. Oh, no. Okay. I know some people do this with their pets where they yes. taxidermy them. I think I think it's interesting. I'm not like again, you know, whatever. But like, yes. but it's, it's not my thing. I don't think. Um, right. yep. Oscar uh, yes. and I've actually told other uh, I've told other folks this on the show before. Um, I was on the American sleep drug Ambien while on a flight back from Finland to Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. and I guess that I stopped in the Iceland airport where I got Oscar. I don't remember any of that. Okay. Okay. Well, nice to meet you, Oscar. Yeah, he's good. He's a good, he's a good person. Some of my favorite people are. Oh, are okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Live from West Berlin, it's the committee program with Julia Doubleday, Forrest Lovett, Jan Mameli, Jebat Kastrati, and yours truly, Jacopo Castelletti. And now, back in the committee studios, your host, Arun Chowdhury. Fill in joke here later. What, what the... And now, committee confessions. Hi, and welcome to the committee program. I am your host, Arun Chaudhary. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a new segment. It's called Committee Confessions. And originally, it was designed to be a vessel to hold some of Julia Doubleday's more pointed rants uh, and keep the public safe from that. In this case, it's going to be to take some of my more negative predictions and be an explosion chamber to keep, again, you, the listening public, safe from our cynicism here on the show. You know, we are not journalists. We are political communicators. And often it, we can come across extremely cynically. So tonight we will focus on two elections in this confession segment. The first is Hungary, in which I will read to you from an article that I have just written that's about this subject. And the second will be France, in which we'll bring in a, a friend of the show and a friend of mine, Pauline. So uh, let's begin in Hungary. And despite what anyone may have told you, okay, dear listener, you are not a snowflake. I don't mean that you were less prone to melting, but we are not as unique, perhaps, as we might like to believe. Now, elections happen in cycles. The previous cycle of elections started in Italy, in Emilia-Romagna, that's a regional election, and continued through the United States with the election of Joe Biden and ended with a German federal election this fall. And what those demonstrated was that the traditional and the center left, with the addition of the civic left, had a workable majority against a hardening right wing, and as the global crisis pushed the electorate left economically, they were prepared to gain small dividends. Now, last Tuesday in Budapest, Hungary, closing arguments were heard ahead of their April 3rd election. Viktor Orban, the famous illiberal Democrat, an admirer of Vladimir Putin, and an agitator on the right fringes of Europe, is seeking re-election against clean-cut and deeply Christian Mayor Peter Markezoy, who has like 12 kids or something, I think it's actually seven, and who leads a six-party opposition looking to normalize the country and return more fully to the European fold. Along with the contest in France, this heralds a new cycle of elections held during active fighting in the Russia-Ukraine war. Political cliches deflate in such circumstances. We always say all politics is local and nobody votes on foreign policy, but in this case, we need to dust off a different set of assumptions. War, we are often reminded, is uniquely good for incumbents. We call this the rally around the flag effect in the United States. Certainly the numbers from Macron in France bear this out in the proportions that we are used to seeing. But Hungary is a more interesting test because the relatively tight race within five points, uh, measured by some unreliable polling, uh, but also because Orban has direct ties to Vladimir Putin, the face and the voice of this invasion of Ukraine. Orban has thus far put distance between himself and the Russian president and presents himself as a stable choice between two parties, Russia and sort of the U.S., Europe, whose conflict has little to do with the needs of the Hungarian people. As someone lucky enough to be at that opposition rally in Budapest, I can tell you the main messages on display sought strongly to do the opposite, to paint Orban's Hungary as modeled on Putin's Russia, riddled with corruption, media repression, the types of stories that you tend to see in the Western press. How damaging these ties will be is questionable. 
Even since his stunning media disaster on the Polish border, Italian leader of La Lega Matteo Salvini has maintained much more stability in his numbers than one would imagine possible. And in nearby Slovenia, a place we will hear about in next episode quite extensively, Janis Janša, who models himself very much on Orban's style and method, is facing an election in this same cycle, April 23rd. He has actually also pulled further ahead in the polls, like Orban, and has even managed to squeeze in a visit to Kiev with a European delegation to show his support and is calling for no-fly zones and an unlikely number of refugees to come to his country. He is someone who is bending over backwards to turn this narrative around seemingly successfully. This will be the playbook of this electoral cycle, a right wing putting distance between themselves and Vladimir Putin and painting themselves as a third way between two reckless warlike factions, Russia on one hand and Western Europe, US on the other, while they offer common sense stability. And you're gonna see a left wing that will tie, try to tie Putin around the neck of the most popular right wing figures in Europe, Orban and Le Pen being just the first two. However, we often see when the left wing tries to adopt the policies of the right wing, think things like crime and think things like war, often they can think they're coming off Churchill and end up looking pretty Tony Blair. Let's bring in Pauline and get more specific about how war, war messaging is affecting the current landscape of the election in France, where after Hungary, this will be the biggest European continental election. Pauline, hi, how are you? Hello, I'm fine and you? Uh, I am well. Pauline rapier Ferneau is a uh, municipal councillor for the Green Party in a large city outside of Paris in the suburbs there. And I'm going to say it, uh, Boulogne Billancourt. Yes, almost. Like, no. You say Billancourt. it just so that we say it, yeah. we, do, we do you all proud. Boulogne Billancourt. And thank you for coming on. Um, you know, this is traditionally a red-tinged show, and so we appreciate getting a green-tinged perspective <laughs> from time to time. And look, uh, you know, our mutual comrade Nanon was just on here talking to us about the French elections. She was a bit pessimistic. I think, you know, man many of us are. Uh, but that was before the war, and we were just talking about how that affects politics, how sometimes folks on the center left can kind of go over the top to sort of embrace a jingoistic response, how other folks on the right can kind of fall back on their national security. Uh, how have you seen this affect the landscape of the French election? I feel like the war reinforced something that was already going on in our election. It's just like everything is going like if there were no election. Like It's like no one knows we have to vote in 15 days. Like. And I think it was... Uh, There's no sense of campaign. Zero sense of campaign. And I'm currently in the uh, local, like in the office of uh, Yannick Jadot's campaign right now. And That's the I, Green Party candidate. Yes. And I feel like it's the only place and in every candidate's area. It's like it's the only places where people actually think about the campaign. But in the general, like people's opinion and stuff, it feels like there is no campaign. And I think it was mainly the case with first the COVID which was like the main topics like during all these times. And also because our president like waited until the last moment to say he actually was candidate and he refused all debate, all discussion, everything. No, it's mine. Like my colleague asking to take my glasses and my phone charger. Absolutely not. Mine. No. Yeah. yeah, it's mine. The Greens, they always want to share everything. Like the sense of exactly. property is important too. Like. We are not red people. We are green people. We <laughs> have our own stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. Um, so it reinforced this because, like, Macron just said he was gonna he was candidate, and he didn't even ca come to a journalist show or something. He just wrote a letter, so no one could question him about anything. Just wrote a letter, and then so there's been the war, and now he just put himself in like. He's like a, a spectacle, like a theater. He just mm -hmm. shows people with pictures of him being at work, like very focused on like how he deal with the war. And and he showed up in to... Moscow, right? He's a shower upper. Yeah, like he's good exactly. at that. Yeah. Yeah. And he's doing it very well because like knows the like, uh, how do you call the stuff with the numbers that say where the candidates are? The polls. The polls. Okay. He's so getting polls, a real bump. Yeah. Yeah. He's like at 30 percent on the polls yeah, and we... it feels like he's going to be president anyway. And that makes everyone like 
not being into the campaign. They just feel like, oh, it's going to be Macron anyway. So they don't really think about it. They don't really are interested in it. And I would tend to agree with Ninon, like the, the other French person that came last time. And we were saying it's really depressing because for all of us who are young, who want a better future or who just want a future, uh, it's hard to think we're going to have five more years of, some, of someone who don't care at all about environment, about any social reality. Like the, he is, the only thing he's talking about is like nothing about ecology. And all the thing he's proposing for the future is like cutting on social rights of people. Like it's just going to be five more years of more precarity, more tension and nothing about ecology. And also nuclear. You say nuclear in English? Yeah. Uh, so he wants to build new ones and we know it's not a solution for fighting climate change. So it just he's got a good environment for it, though, with everyone talking about Russian energy for sure. Um, how about this big mobilization uh, that Mélenchon just did? Uh, yeah. it, this was this did this? It seemed like a lot of folks were there. I know, ostensibly, it's about something bigger than him, but in reality, it's a rally for him and his people. How yeah. did it feel? Does it feel like it's any traction there? Well, I know a lot of people who are not necessarily supporting Mélenchon who went there just because it's a political event and there is not that much political And there's things. no sort of pillars, right, to sort of rally around. Yeah, and it's, so it's like we just, some of us just went there just to see, to feel the, the atmosphere. Um, I don't think it was that big. Like, I actually went there to take a coffee with friends just near the area and I expected more people, but at the same time, seeing like 10,000 of people who were just there to listen to a political meeting in a period where no one cares about like real politics, like no one is really into it. To see some people who are ready to go out on a Sunday to just mm -hmm. participate to a march for a candidate where like, whereas most people just say, oh, I don't want to touch politics. Like they're all the same. It's not interesting. It gave me hope like to think there are still some people that really were interested in this and uh, ready to put energy in it. Uh, it was not for my candidate, but it was still good to see some people were ready to go outside to push a candidate with radical ideas like that are seen as radical, but really like left ideas and they were willing to go outside to support it. It gave me a little bit of hope. Now, when, I mean, is there a chance, this will be a slightly naive American question, although naive on both sides, because these things are always reported as impossible till they're possible. Is the absolute sort of lack of enthusiasm from anyone on the left and probably from many even in the center, does it actually boost Le Pen's chances as we've also seen her kind of solidify as the second runner up status and uh, one of the predictions we had on the show of uh, Valerie running up from the Republican side seems to have not really happened. She yeah. seems to have been a bit no. of a disappointment. Well, to on one people. side, there is, yeah. Uh, so on one side, I think for Marine Le Pen, she benefits from Mélenchon going up. The fact that we get closer to the, to the end of the election, uh, Mélenchon, exactly like 2017, is going up also in the polls. And so there is people on the left that say, oh, the smart choice or like the useful choice, mm -hmm. like in Tactical French, vote. The, yeah tactical vote. Okay, in French, vote utile. So a lot of people on the left are saying the tactical vote is Mélenchon. And a lot of people on the right and in far right are just saying, okay, so the tactical vote is Marine Le Pen. So Eric Zemmour and the, the fascist one, yeah. uh, <laughs> Eric Zemmour is going down and also Valérie Pécresse is going down and they are like, it benefits uh, Marine Le Pen who is seen as a tactical vote on the right. Um, so she is going up at the same time as Mélenchon is going up. Uh, on the other side for Valérie Pécresse, what I think is... So I consider her as a personal enemy just because last year I was uh, working for a candidate uh, for Ile-de-France, like the main region of France. And I was working for the Green candidate who was against Valérie Pécresse. So it's been like two years I'm fighting against her. And for the what I think with her, I think is she's in a how do you call a street where you can go on a way but not go outside? Uh, it was like a one way street. Okay, a one way street like when you arrive and there is no exit. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a uh, uh, non issue, like ah. 
Uh, just like it's not, it's a dead end. Dead end. Yeah, dead, dead end? Dead end, yeah. Okay, so she's in a dead end. Like, there is a French expression saying it. I don't know if it's correct to translate it in English, but she's in a dead end. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, 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 yeah. she, no, like, they were a space for, like, the traditional right, but she, in her primary, ended up being her with the one being super racist. And so to get everyone, she got to move even more on the racist uh, part of the, like, anti-immigration, like, French identity, blah, blah, blah. So she took the line to go on the same topics as the far right. So she got stuck between Emmanuel Macron, who is doing a right wing... Right, who um, just creeps over any real estate yeah, you give him on the so, right, he's just going to eat yeah. it. Yeah. He, he's on the right. Like, his policy is on the right, so he's taking all the votes on the right. And people like right wing electors are happy with what Macron is doing. And so on the other side, there is the far right. And if you have another candidate who is trying to be on the far right, like people are just going to vote for the original far right one, like the original racist. Why would they go totally. for a new racist yeah, who yeah, are just yeah. a little less racist? And it ended up having us with some debate between Eric Zemmour and, Mar and Valérie Pécresse, who were just both saying, oh, you copy me. No, you copy me. No, you copy me. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm stronger than you on immigration. No, I'm stronger. And it just made no sense. And it's and not like, the TV. Yeah, it was like, ridiculous debate and at the same time it was showing exactly her problem like she tried to get the vote of like extreme right and now she's blocked in her dead end and too bad for her i think the one thing that surprised that surprises me that has surprised me continues to surprise me and you are just echoing and maybe we'll have this be the last uh bit is how empowered you are as an incumbent in france to sort of not run Right in the U.S., this would bite you in the ass if you like don't show up to things, if you won't debate people, if you won't like announce when everybody knows. Like eventually, it's not cute anymore, and somebody else just eclipses you because they take the spotlight. But the way like Macron has been able to sort of not participate, not talk about things, not inform people on the election, uh, I is is it's American <laughs> in sort of in scope, uh, and yet it's the French who are really spearheading this. Like. Uh, in a country that sort of to us is so famously political, how is it yeah. that running away and not engaging can be so successful? Yeah, I don't understand. Like, really, even for me, I'm just like, but it feels like there is kind of an echo, like it works both ways. There is a candidate not trying to being a candidate. And at the same time, so people just feel like it's not a moment, like it's not a political moment like there is no need to be engaged and it's like the both things are going parallel like i don't know if you see what i mean but i feel like and so it works this way but i think it's also a matter of like five years of macron uh trying to kind of kill the debate and not, never going to um have explanation with journalists never he, he never wanted any confrontation so it felt like he was always on like on top of everything mm -hmm. floating above, and like the yeah. other people were like debating between them but it was just too too important for this like dealing with the real stuff like like dealing with Fr france and like with the big affair and like so the other one the little one could fight between them but it was not his not his problem and but i it's really hard for me to explain because people are not disengaged like they are engaged in a lot of things like there is thousands of people helping migrants all over france like there is people going to protest they've been the mm -hmm. yellow jacket the gilet jaune uh, there have been a lot of protests during all macron's mandate like everyone have been moving and it's been it's not like if people just have been waiting and doing nothing so people are engaged but there is a missing link between people involvement and electoral politics. the fact that yeah, they could change something. And I think the, the one of the main responsible for this is not Macron, but it's a socialist party. Because since I'm born, I've seen the right and the left and the so-called left, uh, the one and the other, and nothing absolutely changed. And for people, I'm only 26. Some people are 40 years old or 50 years old, as if they've seen both several times and nothing changed. And I understand people 
like they're not stupid they're right to conclude that whoever is in power nothing is going to change because nothing is changing and i think the socialist party in uh, 2012 who got elected and for five years did nothing they are the main responsible for this situation they showed how they they showed that left in power did nothing or they, they could have they haven't but it's hard now for people like us to just go and meet people and say hey are you gonna vote for us and so just saying i'm not voting anymore or i'm not interested in this or i don't believe politicians and they're kind of right like you can't lie to them 10 times and then come to see them and accept them to believe you like why would they trust you now no you're t and that's the exact point of kind of uh talking about the hungarian and then I think the French election here is because I think this cycle of elections is going to be really bad for the center left for two reasons. One, because of the kind of over -eager eagerness of embracing war uh, at the same time as not having the national security bona fides of the right. And also, we have a string of elections that are exactly as you described these older election in France happening with Joe Biden, with Olaf Scholz. Uh, a lot of kind of fragile center-left coalitions that are not being able to deliver the things that they were elected to do yeah. because of politics, because of a lot of reasons. But you're going to see a lot of young people, uh, people from the civic left, people who actually kind of were like, yeah, I'm going to do this, not want to do it again. <laughs> well, there is something that changed in my life. Like since I was born, I always wanted to be involved to save the planet and to make the world a better place. And it's still what makes me move every day. Like I put a lot of energy trying to make my green candidate being as high as possible in the poll because I feel like it's going to change the space for ecology in the debate for five years. So I really put energy in it. But something changed recently. Like uh, the last uh, report of, how do you say it in English? Like. Um, it's Jack in French, like international uh, experts that deliver mm -hmm. um, situation on the planet. Every the time, climate. yeah, yeah. Every time there is a new one, I feel super depressed. Um, oh, yeah. And so this time, when the one got released, I just had uh, this thing in my head, and I was like, okay, well, the world is just going to be worse and worse. Like there is no better future coming. But I. And before that, I was always thinking my only way to survive to this bad world coming is to get involved as much as I can and to make everything I can do to make it change but kind of in a sacrificial way and just to sacrifice everything so I just make the world a better place and hope in 10 years then oh yes I have the better place and now I can live and now I can be happy and I had this thing in my head and be like okay so now it's the war in uh, like in at the border of Europe there is a war and like there is a pandemic and like the climate change is becoming real and everywhere in our world and I just realized okay I can get involved but I also have to be happy now and like there is like you can find happiness everywhere so you can be in an action blocking uh, Total or like another big oil company and just take the time also it's gonna sound super naive but take the time to be happy because there is some sun and it just feels good to be right now with other activists doing something so I feel like the future is not really bright or it doesn't make me hope a lot but I just decided I know it's not gonna be fun but I'm gonna just be happy on the way and I do my way to make the world better but if on my if it doesn't work at least on my way I will have find friends and happiness doing this so I think I think I found a way to not being fully depressed on this and it was something to do right everybody needs something to do yes <laughs> <laughs> also it, it's something to do but I'd be happy fighting for social justice without the climate change. Like I'd be happy without this like limit and like kind of this. It's like every second we wait, it's even more too late. Like it's not mm -hmm. Englishly correct to say this, but like, and so it's like this this feeling of emergency all the time that is super stressful. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna find a way. Like I'll keep going. I'll keep trying. Um, gonna run to be a deputy 
Uh, oh, excellent. Yeah, I don't think I'll be elected, but I'll do my best to try. All right, and... don't say that on the air, okay? We are. We hope and expect <laughs> that you will find the votes to be elected. This is yeah. the official line from the campaign, True. everyone. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to be deputy, like in June 2022. I'll be a new French excellent. deputy. And I'll make my best for five years for, like, every single other deputy, everyone from the right, everyone from the other party and the government, all of them, they're going to hear about the climate emergency every single day, all the time. I won't let them rest a single second and we will force them because I won't be the only one. We'll be like at least 10 or 20 of girls like me trying to make things move and we won't let them rest a second if they don't like really take seriously our future. So this is that is some bold-faced optimism to end the segment with. Uh, thank you so much for delivering the kind of energy that I'm not famous for and I never <laughs> infuse the show with. So okay. thank you for that. Uh, but well, really good you. to see you, Pauline. As yeah. always, thank you for coming on. Thanks for talking to us. And I have an idea after the elections or maybe after the first round. You, me, Nanone, Clement, we should all uh, have a little round table and say what happened, what do we think, how did it all yeah. turn out? And how we do the revolution, because like if we have Le Pen and Macron, maybe we need a small revolution just to like shake them a little. A little one, a little revolution. Yeah, yeah a little yeah. one, just like this, because you know it's France, so if you, let's just do a little revolution. Committee, committato, committed, committato, a rule, committee, we young way, submitting. Ciao and welcome back to our polling update here at the polling channel, brought to you by the committee program. Beginning with Chile, where we find a firm and mild majority of 54.3% of voters in favor of the new constitution proposed by the convention per activa pulso ciudadano. In Costa Rica, the second round of their presidential election seems pretty settled, with Chavez of the PPSD dominating Figueres of the PLN. <laughs> but don't get too excited, both parties are in the center. Interesting results coming in from Punjab, where center-left AAP wins for the first time, projected to gain 71 seats for a total of 91, while alternative center-left party, the INC, drops 58 seats to 19, which is 91 backwards. As reported on the show before, Yong Soo Kyul of the People Power Party has won in South Korea presidential election, but final results show the final result between him and Lee Jae Myung to be less than one point away, with 48.56 to 47.83 respectively. Finally in France, we have Ipsos Soprasteria polls confirming what we've already reported. Macron's substantial bump following the war maintains even if it is dipping somewhat. For more staff here at the polling channel, thank you so much for watching and stay safe out there. Hi, and welcome to a movie for a committee afternoon. You know, we have before in this segment watched American war propaganda from World War II. We watched the Battle for Britain which is a rock'em sock'em hour and a half with dog fights and dramatic action. That is one way in which American war propaganda works. And you've even seen that recently with the war between Ukraine and Russia, the kind of jingoistic mode that our government and in fact our media, they get excited about the war part of it. There's also the other kind of follow-up, this is why whatever's happening doesn't violate our principles propaganda that is just as interesting and perhaps even more American at the root of it. Today, we're going to watch a short film. It's just 10 minutes long uh, about the Japanese internment program, one of the very shameful episodes of U.S. participation in World War II. Uh, we're going to watch uh, this film, which is called Japanese Relocation, because they certainly don't call it internment. They tend not to call it camps, uh, even though we know concentration camps were actually an invention of the British and then uh, used by the Americans. It's not something the Germans came up with on their own. Uh, let's watch the film. You're going to see some of the principles by which this works. Famously, Reagan with, uh, you know, mistakes were made. This is kind of the... 
one of the pinnacles of American kind of slippery political speak, but actually you can see that kind of energy in the narration in Japanese relocation. It became necessary. Uh, the, you know, it's the kind of thing that the, uh, the narrator, whose name is actually Milton Eisenhower, it's the kind of thing he say, you know, it became necessary, but then he'll say, we knew some of these people were traitors. Like, we knew that. So, like, that part we get to know, but then when it becomes necessary to lock people up, it again becomes authorities determined that it was necessary. It's this passive voice kind of Orwellian situation. Anyway, let's watch the film and I will see you on the other side. became a potential combat zone. Living in that zone were more than 100,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds of them American citizens, one-third aliens. We knew that some among them were potentially dangerous. Most were loyal. But no one knew what would happen among this concentrated population if Japanese forces should try to invade our shores. Military authorities therefore determined that all of them citizens and aliens alike would have to move. This picture tells how the mass migration was accomplished. Neither the Army nor the War Relocation Authority relished the idea of taking men, women, and children from their homes, their shops, and their farms. So the military and civilian agencies alike determined to do the job as a democracy should, with real consideration for the people involved. First attention was given to the problems of sabotage and espionage. Now, here at San Francisco, for example, convoys were being made up within sight of possible Axis agents. There were more Japanese in Los Angeles than in any other area. In nearby San Pedro, houses and hotels occupied almost exclusively by Japanese were within a stone's throw of a naval air base, shipyards, oil wells. Japanese fishermen had every opportunity to watch the movement of our ships. Japanese farmers were living close to vital aircraft plants. So as a first step, all Japanese were required to move from critical areas such as these. But of course this limited evacuation was a solution to only part of the problem. The larger problem, the uncertainty of what would happen among these people in case of a Japanese invasion, still remained. That is why the commanding general of the Western Defense Command determined that all Japanese within the coastal area should move inland. Immediately the army began mapping evacuation areas and for a time encouraged the Japanese to leave voluntarily. The trouble for the voluntary evacuees soon threatened in their new locations. So the program was quickly put on a planned and protected basis. Thereafter, the American citizen Japanese and Japanese aliens made their plans in accordance with army orders. Notices were posted. All persons of Japanese descent were required to register. They gathered in their own churches and schools, and the Japanese themselves cheerfully handled the enormous paperwork involved in the migration. Civilian physicians made preliminary medical examinations. Government agencies helped in a hundred ways. They helped the evacuees find tenants for their farms. They helped businessmen lease, sell, or store their property. Now, this aid was financed by the government, but quick disposal of property often involved financial sacrifice for the evacuees. Now the actual migration got underway. The army provided fleets of vans to transport household belongings, and buses to move the people to assembly centers. The evacuees cooperated wholeheartedly. The many loyal among them felt that this was a sacrifice they could make in behalf of America's war effort. In 
small towns as well as large, up and down the coast, the moving continued. Behind them, they left shops and homes they had occupied for many years. Their fishing fleets were impounded and left under guard. Now they were taken to racetracks and fairgrounds where the army almost overnight had built assembly centers. They lived here until new pioneer communities could be completed on federally owned lands in the interior. Santa Anita Racetrack, for example, suddenly became a community of about 17,000 persons. The army provided housing and plenty of healthful, nourishing food for all. The residents of the new community set about developing a way of life as nearly normal as possible. They held church services, Protestant, Catholic, and Buddhist. They issued their own newspaper, organized nursery schools, and some made camouflage nets for the United States Army. Meanwhile, in Arizona, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, and elsewhere, quarters were being built where they would have an opportunity to work, and more space in which to live. When word came that these new homes were ready, the final movement began. relocation center, evacuees were met by an advanced contingent of Japanese who had arrived some days earlier and who now acted as guides. Naturally, the newcomers looked about with some curiosity. They were in a new area, on land that was raw, untamed, but full of opportunity. Here they would build schools, educate their children, reclaim the desert. Their own physicians took precautions to guard against epidemics. They opened advanced Americanization classes for college students, who in turn would instruct other groups. They made a rough beginning of self-government. For while the army would guard the outer limits of each area, community life and security within were largely up to the Japanese themselves. They immediately saw the need for developing civic leaders. At weekly community meetings, citations were given to the block leaders who had worked most diligently. Special emphasis was put on the health and care of these American children of Japanese descent. Their parents, most of whom are American citizens, and their grandparents, who are aliens, immediately wanted to go to work. At Manzanar, they built a lath house and began rooting guayuli cuttings. The plants, when mature, will add to our rubber supply. At Parker, they undertook the irrigation of fertile desert lands. Meanwhile, in areas away from the coast and under appropriate safeguards, many were permitted to enter private employment, particularly to work in sugar beet fields where labor was badly needed. Now, this brief picture is actually the prologue to a story that is yet to be told. The full story will begin to unfold when the raw lands of the desert turn green, when all adult hands are at productive work on public lands or in private employment. It will be fully told only when circumstances permit the loyal American citizens once again to enjoy the freedom we in this country cherish, and when the disloyal, we hope, have left this country for good. In the meantime, we are setting a standard for the rest of the world in the treatment of people who may have loyalties to an enemy nation. We are protecting ourselves without violating the principles of Christian decency. And we won't change this fundamental decency no matter what our enemies do. 
But of course, we hope most earnestly that our example will influence the Axis powers in their treatment of Americans who fall into their hands. Yes, so it's grim stuff, right? And the protestation, you know, we didn't want to have to do this. Uh, this might have been financially uh, stressful for the evacuees. As we're explaining that these people have to pay for the privilege of getting moved in many ways. It really is, you know, they're actually making parachutes and munitions for the war effort, uh, f even though they're considered disloyal to that war effort. It really is, it's a lot to take in and the matter of fact way in which it's portrayed and the kind of positive spin, you know, they're reclaiming the desert and making it grow. It's like, is that really what these folks want to be doing? Uh, is just when you're explaining you're losing is one of the things that we say in politics, you know, and these style propaganda films sometimes really do seem like a kind of haughty explanation that doesn't really land anywhere. Circumstances will permit us to let these people come home. That's going to be great. Another kind of passive voice cry at the end, but that might not be the audience. It might not be, it may, it may not be a mission of persuasion. I think a video or film rather like this gives people who are predisposed to believe it the arguments and ammunition verbally they need to be able to have those conversations with their friends and neighbors. So this is aimed at, you know, a white silent majority of Americans who don't want to think that what's happening is bad. If I can give them five, six, seven arguments, they can carry that forward into the public sphere where actual persuasion happens, right? This film is going to be seen, you know, maybe in some movie theaters right before the cartoon, right after the newsreel, however it all works. It's not necessarily to be consumed in the bombastic, huge way that Know Your Enemy Japan by Frank Capra, you know, one of the biggest sort of scaremongering. Uh, in fact, we should watch that one. We watched the, the Battle for Britain. We should watch Know Your Enemy Japan. But no, no, we should do other places and other wars and other things before we come back to this. But thank you so much. Uh, I think it's important that we take these kind of things apart, and I appreciate you being here with me to do so. We are your committee program. See ya. Thanks so much for tuning into the committee program. We know you have many options when it comes to content consumption, and we appreciate your attention to this new season with new episodes on Sundays at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and at 10 p.m. Central European Time. You can support the show by becoming a member on patreon.com slash the committee program. You can follow committee on Twitter, uh, backslash committee pro, on YouTube, the committee program, on Instagram, the committee program, on Facebook, the committee program, and you can visit the committee program company store at tpublic.com, the committee program shop. Special thanks, as always, to our team, Javad Castrati, Fiamma Melli, Jacopo Castelletti, Forrest Levet, and committee's deputy director, Julia Doubleday. Look alive out there. It's later than you think. This was the seventh program in our second series. For more global infotainment from the committee program, click on the video screen right or screen left. Please like and subscribe to the committee program on Sundays at 4 p.m. Eastern and 10 p.m. Central European time.